Hello everyone and good morning and good evening to those of you here in the States. I'd like to welcome you to our virtual field trips, Parks, Peoples and Plastics with Mark Rog Reed from Parks Victoria. Now for our virtual field trips, we love interaction from classrooms all over the world and everybody watching. So a little bit of housekeeping. If you're watching on YouTube, you can use the chat space that is right below your viewer and go ahead and ask questions now and at any time during the event. If you're watching on earthecho.org, there is a Google form beneath your viewer that you can use to ask questions. Now this live event is part of our 2018 expedition, Plastic Seeds. This expedition happened last October in Melbourne, Australia. The Earth Echo team, led by our founder, Philippe Cousteau Jr., brought educators to the front line of Australia's unique ecosystems to look at the impact of litter and microplastics on the organisms that call Australia home. Our Plastic Seas resources include four exciting expeditions videos hosted by Philippe Cousteau, highlighting our plastic journey. We also have STEM career close-ups with the experts that we met in Australia. And we also have youth in action videos that highlight the amazing work that youth are doing in their communities to fight this ocean crisis. And last but not least, the 25 teachers that have joined us on Plastic Seas are now Earth Echo Expedition Fellows. And they have been working for the past three months to make STEM lessons come to life for teachers around the world. These lessons include learning about a product's life cycle to a STEM design challenge for a Nurdle capture device and lots more. You can head over to our website after this event to download these resources for free, thanks to our presenting sponsor, the Northrop Grumman Foundation. We would also like to thank our amazing Expedition Plastic Seas partners. We couldn't have done the expedition without you all. And now I'd like to introduce our live interactive classroom, Mrs. Stutchberry's class from Calke State School in Queensland. You guys wanna go ahead and say hi? Awesome to have you with us, and we'll check in with you in a little bit for questions, okay? Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. 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 So good to have you with us. And now I would like to introduce Mark Rodriguez. He is coming to us live from Barwon Head Bluff, which is a marine sanctuary in Australia. Go ahead and take it away, Mark. Uh, good morning or good evening or good night to wherever you happen to be in the world. Welcome to Barwon Bluff Marine Sanctuary down here at the southern end of Australia. I'm really pleased to be able to bring this park. This is one of the places that I get to look after. It's part of my job of looking after the, the animals, the plants, the habitats that we, we have here in Victoria um, it, as part of my work. But yeah, I'm great to, it's great to be able to share a little bit of our place with, with the rest of you. Mark, would you like to tell us a little bit more about where you are in the world? Oh, thanks, Jacqueline. I'm looking for the cues there. Um, so look, um, so Barwon Bluff Marine Sanctuary is one of 24 protected areas that that, that uh, my team, the Parks Victoria staff, look after. These are protected areas, just like national parks on the land, uh, protecting the animals and plants and the habitats that we find here in Victoria. A lot of our animals and plants are found nowhere else on the earth. So we have a very uh, big responsibility to look after and make sure that the things that live here stay here forever. Uh, we try to manage some of the issues to do with protecting uh, things from invasive species. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as part of our presentation. But certainly our protected areas like there are in many other parts of the world, are some of the most important ways we can go about looking after and ensuring our natural environments are uh, they're going to be there in the future so that the younger people in our in our group today uh, get a chance to, I know it might sound a little bit uh, of a scary thought, but maybe one day you might have children and you might even have grandchildren too. And I'd like to think that the world that your grandchildren will get to see is a healthy world um, that's full of really beautiful places, places where animals and plants can thrive and when it comes to the sea we hope that there's lots of protected areas that help to look after and make sure that many of these places are going to be there for your grandchildren that's what it's really all about trying to make sure that we we do what we can together uh, to look after these special places
So Mark, do you want to tell us a little bit about the photos that we're seeing? Um, I can't actually see the photos, Jacqueline, so I'm not, not sure what, what, uh, what I'm looking at at the moment, actually. So um, there's like a tiny little screen at the bottom, so I, you're not actually sharing the presentation at the moment with the rest of the group. So I'm not sure if there's a technological problem there at the moment. But um, if we just quickly flick back to the beginning of the slides, uh, we started off with a bit of a view of the world. That's the one. Yep, beautiful. Thank, thank you. So we're basically looking here at, at our planet um, and particularly looking at it from the point of view of Australia. Um, as you can see, Australia is a very, very big island. It's a place that's completely surrounded by water. And it has, the of all of the countries around the world, probably the biggest coastline anywhere on the planet. Um, we have areas that stretch from the far tropical warm north, so up where the, where, the, uh, where the students are up in Queensland, where it's nice and warm in the water, right down here to the chilly, cool southern waters of Victoria. Um, Victoria itself, um, as you can see in the next slide, is basically a place where we've got, again, a long coastline. So Victoria is the bit of land just to the north of that strip of water in the middle. Uh, there's a big island down the bottom underneath us called Tasmania, which is another one of the states of Australia. A uh, very beautiful place to visit also, very cool. But our, our coastline basically faces south and it's basically what we call a cool water or a temperate marine environment. It's a place where basically uh, you don't sort of go snorkeling or diving too often without a wetsuit. Um, up there in Queensland, you guys might jump in the water quite a lot, but just basically in your bathers or whatever it is. But down here, or you two, Jacqueline, over there in Florida, you're jumping without the wetsuit, as Jacqueline would remember extremely well. And I seem to remember her being very cold when she was here in the water last year. Um, yes, we have nice chilly water, but that doesn't mean that there's not really cool things that live here as well. Um, as you can see in the next slide, um, we've got basically a range of different habitats and my organisation, we look after parks across the state. So not only the marine national parks and the marine sanctuaries that are part of my work, but we also have some fantastic landscapes, really ancient places that have been around for many, many thousands of years that are now protected uh, for all people and for all times, for people who live here in Victoria and for our many visitors that come from other parts of Australia and also come from other parts of the world. Uh, the Grampians National Park in the slide at the moment is a good example of that. And as you can see in the next slide, it's a place that's not only important for um, for the natural values, these are places also that have got a long history of use by people. Um, we're talking about basically the Aboriginal people that live here in Victoria and across Australia that have cared for the land for many, many thousands of years, 40,000 to 100,000 years of Aboriginal uh, stewardship or caring for our land has essentially given us what we've got today. And it's really important when we think about our landscapes and our seascapes as well, that we acknowledge the great work that has been done by our our, basically our traditional owners, as we call them, the people who've looked after this country for so long and respect the, the ways that they actually looked after and cared for uh, their country. We, we call it caring for country and it's very much one of the themes that we try to use in Parks Victoria is to remember and always pay respect to the people who've looked after our land for so long. We've also got um, a fantastic coastline. And here's a shot of the 12 apostles, basically on the uh, Western Victorian coastline. It's a pretty famous place and many tourists come to visit this site. It's a place where you've got a whole lot of erosion along the coastline that's created some fantastic uh, landforms, some uh, basically big rock pinnacles that stick out in the water. The name 12 Apostles is probably a little bit of a bit of an odd one. There might have been 12 once upon a time, but there's certainly not 12 anymore uh, because the sea doesn't keep still at all. And this is a part of Victoria where they get very, very strong uh, waves coming out of the Southern Ocean. Uh, they actually collapse over a period of time. And in the last five, 10 years or so, we've actually lost one. So there's, I think we're down to seven Apostles now, but the name still stays as the 12 Apostles. And this is actually one of our marine national parks, a little bit further west from where I'm talking to you today. Um, what I wanted to show, share with you, though, is a little bit of vision of what it looks like underwater. And that's actually me, uh, probably the best day I've ever had in the office, which is this is my office some of the time. Unfortunately, I spend far too much time behind a computer these days. But just to share with you some of the fantastic animals and plants that live here. This is another marine sanctuary, not too far from where I am now. You can see uh, the colourful marine life. Yes, not all the colourful things live in Queensland. There are some down here in Victoria as well. And we have some really special animals and plants 
Uh, but particularly in terms of the animals, our magnificent weedy sea dragon. This is our state emblem here in Victoria. It's the only place in the world where it's found is actually here in Southern Australia. And that's actually why it was selected as our, as our marine animal. So you can see from the vision that there's some pretty important stuff that we need to be able to look after. We need to put aside some places and protect those areas so that people can come and enjoy them. And for that reason, uh, the Victorian government about uh, nearly 18 years ago created a system of marine national parks and marine sanctuaries, what we might call marine protected areas, that are there to try and make sure that these places like national parks on the land uh, provide uh, provide a way for these animals, plants and the communities that support them uh, to exist into the future. I'm wondering if there's, um, when we actually look at look at some of the habitats that we find in our Victorian marine environment. Uh, we've got a whole range of different habitats. We've got rocky reef environments, such as the one where I'm sitting at the moment down here in Bowen Heads. These wonderful places, again, provide solid real estate for plants and animals. Under the water, we have kelp forests or places where seaweeds or marine algae, as they're more properly called, provide, just like forests on the land do, a great habitat, great protection. They provide food and shelter for many different sorts of animals, from the fish that live swim around in the water Water, through to the things that might crawl around on the base there, like the rock lobsters and the snails and things like that. We also have uh, fantastic areas of seagrass, and seagrasses are again another type of plant that live in the sea. These are places, these are plants that basically have flowers, so they're quite different to seaweeds or the algae. Um, they're really important places, particularly for fish many different sorts of fish, including things like the beautiful seahorse you can see in the photo now, um, and th uh, that, that they depend upon these habitats for their, their early part of their life. Um, these, these habitats also extend down into the deeper water, so we've got deep reef systems. Where there's no sunlight, obviously plants can't grow, so you get a different community uh, living there made up mainly of animals, such as these beautiful uh, yellow zoanthids that you might find in some of the deeper waters around Victoria. Um, when we actually go a little bit further, we've also got some other, other sorts of habitats that are also found there. I'm finding it a little bit hard to see what, what the picture is of at the moment, but that's, uh, again, just another example, basically, of some of the different sorts of habitats that we actually find, uh, find and, down here. Mark, in this photo, I see a camouflaged creature that is uh, very unique. Do you know which one I'm talking oh, about? The, the weedy sea dragon. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the, the weedy sea dragon. Oh, sorry, the cuttlefish, yes. It's very hard to see on my screen at the moment. It's a little tiny, little tiny square. Uh, but yeah, the cuttlefish is one of our fantastic animals of Southern Australia. Yes, they do live in other parts of the world, uh, but these are the masters of camouflage. They can change their body shape and color to blend in with their backgrounds. Uh, they really are quite extraordinary. And again, here, and I, get it, I like to sort of think about the special things that are here in Southern Australia. Uh, we have the world's biggest cuttlefish down here across our Southern Australian coastline. They grow to over a metre or so in terms of their size. In our next slide, what are we seeing here, Jacqueline? Ah, right, of course, one of my other favourite animals, a cousin of the of the cuttlefish in the same group. It's another mollusk. Uh, but this is one of our, sometimes what are called the butterflies of the sea. They've got a pretty uh, interesting name. They're called nudibranchs. Uh, they're, a, they're a sea slug. That's probably a little bit less uh, exciting a name than calling it a nudibranch, and you can find out more about those. These are these are specialised slugs that like to feed on some of the animals that live on the uh, the rocky on the rocky reefs environments. They really are quite spectacular in terms of their colour. And like many of the animals and plants that I've talked about so far, that we'll see again in the future in the next few slides. These are all things that are what we say is endemic, or they they're only found in our part of the world. One of the reasons why we have these parks is to make sure that these things exist into the future. We also have lots of really interesting fish. The horseshoe leather jacket that you're hopefully seeing at the moment is a good example of one of the many uh, different species of fish that we have here in Victoria. 85% of our fish in Victoria are found nowhere else in the world. So again, if we want to think about why we should be looking after and protecting some areas, and we have about 5% of our coastline as these protected areas, uh, we don't allow fishing in those areas, we don't allow people to collect, um, but it's a way of ensuring that some of these unique and diverse species that we have here are going to be there into the future. And what are we seeing here at the moment, Jacqueline? Looks like a flock of birds. 
a flock of birds, okay, because the marine environment is not just about the animals that live under the water. There are obviously a huge number of animals that depend upon the water and the marine ecosystems for their food, um, for their breeding, etc. And this particular group of birds are, again, just a reminder of the fact that our world is actually very connected. This is what we call a group of migratory birds in one of our marine parks in southern Victoria. Um, these birds actually fly not only uh, around in the local area, but they actually fly from the northern hemisphere down here during our summertime or when it's nice and cold up in the, the northern hemisphere for those of you in North America, um, where it probably is quite chilly at the moment. Um, and um, they basically move from one summer to another summertime. So they breed up in the Northern Hemisphere in places like Russia, the very far Eastern part of Siberia. They fly down through places like Korea and Japan, Indonesia, and they make their way down all the way down here to Southern Australia to come here and feed. But there again, another really important reminder of the fact that the world is actually connected, not only by the oceans themselves, but by some of the animals that move between different places in the world um, that actually, again, gives us a good reason why we need to look after our places here because other places depend upon some of those same animals. So when we actually think about our environment, um, the Victorian government uh, as in back in 2002 created a national park system for our marine environment, a protected area system where fishing, as I said a, a moment ago, is not allowed. So this is just like basically saying when you go to the national park on the land, you don't take the chainsaw or the axes along, you don't take uh, take guns and things like that, or you don't go hunting in those areas. Our marine national parks here in Victoria are there to protect uh, animals and plants and the habitats that support them in the absence of people taking things away. And we've got to be very careful about how we look after these places. Uh, people hopefully understand that this is a place that's special, that needs some level of protection. Uh, when they come down to visit, they don't actually bring the fishing rod down with them or go out with their spear guns and things. It's really important. We've got some small areas, as I said, it's about 5% of our coast here in Victoria, that these areas are left alone. They've also got lots of benefits because the animals and plants that live within these park areas get a chance to spread to other parts of the world. So I'm wondering if any of you guys out there have got any questions for me about what I've just talked about in relation to our parks or some of the things you might have just seen. Great, thank you, Mark. I think we're gonna to go to the Calki State School because they have some questions ready for you. My name's Christina and we live in Bunberg in Queensland and are lucky because we have the Great Barrier Reef and endangered loggerhead turtles on our doorstep. They eat plastic. What are the dangers you see in your waterways that lead to the ocean? Well, that's a really great question and I'm really thrilled and glad we had a chance to have a bit of a chat before we started the, uh, the field trip. Um, so we have a, a quite a number of threats that actually happen on the land and this is really the important thing to remember that the land and the sea, while they're different, they're very connected and our waterways lead from the land to the sea. Uh, down here in Victoria we've got very some quite large cities, so Melbourne for example, which is probably from where I'm sitting at the moment about maybe nearly uh, 50, 55 kilometres away from here. That's a very large city with over 4 million people. Um, and again, not everybody's as careful about thinking about the connection between the land and the sea as you guys obviously are. But in our, in our cities and in our smaller towns like where I'm here in Bowen Heads, unfortunately, rubbish ends up on the street. And we do see quite a lot of litter actually wash down our waterways, uh, down through the stormwater system or down through the rivers and things like that and end up in the ocean. So that's one one of the effects that we actually see or where we can actually, uh, we actually see a connection between the land and the sea. And the plastics that are part of that are obviously the issue that we're talking, going to be talking about a bit more today. Um, but some of the other things that happen as well is um, when people uh, basically, uh, there's, there's a lot of what we call nutrients or the foods that, food that's uh, very important for plants to grow, things like nitrogen and phosphorus uh, that are found in things like fertilizers. They're also found in things like sewage, which again, obviously is something that, that all of us contribute to in one way or another. Uh, it's found in stuff like, dare I say, dog poo. Uh, when that sort of stuff washes into our waterways, it can end up in our, in our uh, marine environment as well. And what it does is it encourages algae to grow. And I know up in Queensland, you've had some problems on the reef in recent years with, um, with algae and uh, areas of the reef actually being stressed by 
nutrients or these nitrogens and phosphoruses that are coming out of what we call our catchments or our watersheds if you're in the United States that wash down from the land into the sea and really create situations that are not ideal for the, the plants that should be there or the habitats that should be there. So there's one thing that certainly has an effect that we have a, we see. Uh, another one that, that I deal with a lot in my work is actually animals and plants that come from other parts of the world. Um, here in Victoria, uh, it's been isolated for many, many uh, millions of years from other parts of the world. Um, and because we have such a, a high number of ships that come into our port in Melbourne, um, there are animals and plants that hitchhike a ride from maybe from uh, from up in northeastern Asia, maybe from the Mediterranean, maybe from North America, basically from places where the water temperature is much the same as it is down here, nice and chilly, as uh, Jacqueline again will remember. Um, but they thrive here in our waterways because there's no nothing to eat them. There's nothing that can control them. And they can become what we call marine pests. They are animals or plants that sort of get out of control. We've got down here at the moment a big problem with some seaweeds that originated in the waters around Korea and Japan uh, because of ships bringing them across here and they're spreading very quickly through southeastern Australia. Uh, we've got sea stars that come from the same part of the world, the Northern Pacific sea star, uh, which basically likes to wander along the seabed and eat just about everything it comes across um, that's not sort of able to swim away quickly by itself. Uh, we've got a whole lot of uh, other invertebrates that, that basically come here. And, and that's a really big problem, something that we're working on hard to try and stop those things from spreading, particularly from Port Phillip Bay, where there's lots of ships, uh, to other parts of our coastline where there's very, very few of these animals at the moment. That's a really big part of my work at the moment is trying to look after these marine pests and stopping them from spreading uh, from one place to another. So there's just a couple of examples of where the land and the way we use our waterways can actually influence the health of the, the marine environment. Great question. And we'll come back to the Kalki State School in a little bit and ask you for some more questions. Um, we did have one question um, from earthecho.org, Mark, and that is, how does an area become a marine protected area? That's a really good question, Jacqueline. Now, this is this is something that governments around the world are all trying to think about. How do we actually put aside some areas that are especially for the purpose of conservation? Um, the the way an area becomes a marine protected area is when people care. Um, if you don't, if people don't care about the marine environment, they don't think about the importance of having some areas set aside to uh, where fishing doesn't actually occur. So it's a really, uh, it's it's basically at the end of the day. Uh, protected areas are created by people. When people actually care about their local patch, they care about their backyard, they want to make sure that the animals and plants there are going to be there in the long term. In the same way that national parks on the land uh, are created or formed, governments basically uh, influenced by the people who vote for them uh, basically put aside areas, they create legislation, they create boundaries to say that this this particular place is actually special, uh, that we're not going to allow certain activities that might happen outside the park uh, to occur. And the marine protected areas here in Victoria really came about as a consequence of people who really cared about the special animals and plants, as I said earlier, the unique animals and plants that live down here, making sure that they've got a future, um, and then lobbying the government, working with the community to try and help people to understand that it's actually worthwhile to put some of these areas aside so that we do have a good future uh, for our unique animals and plants in our marine environment. Great, thank you so much, Mark. Um, so we'll go ahead and continue with the presentation. It looks like you have some photos from Expedition here. Exactly. So again, as uh, as Jacqueline's already mentioned, we've we had a fantastic opportunity last year to to start off the uh, the Earth Echo expedition down here to Melbourne uh, by having visitors come to see us down here at the southern end of Port Phillip Bay. And the idea of this was to really try and give people a chance to understand why it's important we start to look at some of these issues of plastics and other other threats to the marine environment by seeing some of the best that we actually do have here in Victoria. And we've got a lot of special places, but down here in southern Port Phillip Bay at the bottom end of the large bay where Melbourne's located. Uh, we have a very big marine national park and you can see some of the uh, some of the, the people who are part of the expedition um, sitting on the edge or standing on the edge, I should say, not sitting, of Swan Bay. And Swan Bay is part of the Port Phillip Heads 
Marine National Park. Uh, what we did for the rest of the day was we actually took them out on a boat. Um, I think in the next slide you can start to see uh, some of the people out there getting uh, getting off the boat and into the water. We had a great uh, experience. And again, Jacqueline, nodding to you, thinking I remember you being particularly cold as you uh, entered the water at that particular point in time. I'm not sure whether that was a, a bit of a shock, but you certainly the look on your face was one of quite a bit of surprise. Uh, but we wanted to basically help them to understand what are some of the things that are affected by some of the issues that we're talking about. So what are the issues around plastics that can start to have an effect? We we're very fortunate to start our trip with by, by going to visit a very special part of the bay uh, where there's a whole lot of seals uh, that are located. And you can see those in the next slide. They're on a special structure. Um, um, called Pope's Eye. Yes, we put people into the water. There we go. Sorry, this is a structure called um, the caisson. Um, and you can see if you look closely that all over the caisson, this is not a natural structure, obviously. It's an old it's an old military structure that now is home for home for probably 30 or 40 seals, depending on the time of the year. They like to get out of the water. They don't actually breed here. They come here from other places. But in the water, they're the absolute clowns of the sea. They get out there, they swim around. And we were very fortunate with the, uh, with the team uh, to be able to see some of these animals circling around us. And again, for those who are able to get under the water and duck dive, uh, to be able to sort of like watch these acrobats of the underwater world uh, do their thing. But seals um, are, again, one of the animals that can be very much affected by plastics that wash down into the ocean. And we'll see some examples of that in a moment. After visiting the seals, we went across to one of our other protected areas, a place called Pope's Eye, again, part of the Port Phillip Heads Marine National Park. And that's uh, an area that's been protected uh, long before the rest of the park system was actually created for since the late 1970s. We see lots of larger and uh, many different types of fish and uh, animals, uh, invertebrates, as well as good healthy kelp forests in that particular area. And so, and I think this actually might even be yourself, Jacqueline, in this photo. I'm just sort of looking at that one now, thinking that that was possibly you admiring one of our local sea stars. Uh, the other slide on I the think, I think other, so. <laughs> I think it is you. Um, the other one on the left hand side there is one of the birds that you can see again from the underwater view. Uh, you can see the feet of the bird as it swims across. So again, these animals and um, plants that live in this protected area are all very much influenced by the things that come down through our waterways, the things that basically enter into the bay. And so while it might feel like when you're out there in amongst the seals or in the Marine National Park that you're a long way from anywhere, that it's a very isolated place, it is very much part of a big, uh, bigger bay system that is has four and a half, five million people nearly living around the outside of it. And as I was talking about a little while ago, uh, some of the things that happen up there on the land, some of the things that hit the streets, whether it's rubbish or it's uh, dog, dog uh, droppings, etc., they do, when it rains, wash down into our bay. And that's one of the unfortunate things we do see from time to time is the impact of some of these, uh, these issues uh, affecting our marine environment. So I'm wondering if anyone's got any questions about the about the excursion itself, the, the field trip that we actually did in the real real time uh, last year. Great. Um, so we do have a question from the Kalki State School. So we're going to go back to them real quick. Hi, I'm Lana. Is there pollution in waterways and oceans getting worse? And are you worried about animals becoming extinct? Um, look, there are some animals here in Victoria that are quite rare and look, we've had problems probably less to do with the waterways but more to do with the way that people have treated them in the past. Uh, the seals that we were just talking about a minute ago, um, at one stage they really were being very heavily hunted back in the 1800s uh, for uh, all sorts of reasons. People used to like to, uh, to hunt seals and actually uh, use their skins for fur coats basically. Now that stopped around about 100 years ago, but prior to that happening, we actually had our populations in Victoria and, and the, uh, the Australian fur seal, which was the one that we were able to swim with when, uh, when Jacqueline and the team were here, they're actually only found here in southeastern Australia and Victoria and in Tasmania. They, their populations got absolutely um, hammered by people hunting them to the point where they became uh, in some places now where there's 25,000, 30,000 seals, they got down to numbers like 10, 14 in different parts of Victoria. So they really nearly became extinct as a result of human activity, that hunting that went on in the, in the, in the past. We see today also some animals and plants, uh, particularly fish, that, that get very heavily targeted by people who want to eat them. Um, 
and while we don't we don't call them endangered species as such they can certainly become quite threatened uh, by overfishing by people taking too many uh, from the water and again that's one of the, excuse me that's one of the very important reasons why we have these protected areas and we don't allow fishing within our marine protected areas so yes it's a it's a big issue probably the, the group of animals that are most in danger that we have here in victoria are actually some of the birds and you remember me showing the picture of the birds that come from Siberia uh, that are that are feeding here in Victoria for the summer months and then go back and have their babies up in the northern hemisphere. Um, there are many of those that are affected not by things that are going on here in Victoria, but by the fact that their habitats, the places that they need to feed on, are, are changing in other parts of the world. Uh, in Siberia, many of them are hunted for food. In some of the places where they feed on the way down to, to Australia um, have been changed. So the big tidal mudflats in places like like Korea have been drained and cleared and now there are buildings on them where there used to be once upon a time lots of nice gooey mud that provides great food for a great place for the food that these birds need to fuel up basically um, those areas are now gone and they're the, some of the things that we're really facing down here in Victoria where there are threats coming from a number of different sources. Uh, the other one I'll just mention and coming back to the pest issue that I said I talked a little bit about, um, this is also another way that animals and plants can become endangered is where you have invasive species just like weeds like you know sort of uh, you know blackberries or uh, animals like cane toads or things like uh, we have a lot of foxes and things like that down here in Victoria unfortunately some of those animals and plants that live in the marine environment like the sea stars or the seaweeds I talked about a minute ago can replace and get rid of uh, not provide any space for or they actually go around and eat uh, some of the animals and plants we have so that's another example of a threatening what we call a threatening process it's basically something that that causes things to become rare and in some cases uh, not so much here in Victoria but in Tasmania a bit further south from where, where I am um, there's a there's a species of fish called the handfish a really unusual fish look it up when you finish the uh, excursion and uh, really quite strange fish that live on the bottom uh, in places like the Derwent estuary in, near Hobart they've actually become highly endangered because of these exotic species these animals uh, that come from other in fact the sea star that comes from uh, up in the north northeast uh, uh, out the northeastern Asian area. So, look, there's a whole lot of things that threaten the marine environment, but the plastics one that we're focusing on today is one that's particularly challenging because of the fact that these things um, move a long way from where they come from, and they do tend to come from places where people are they come through our waterways they come from our streets they come from our our towns and cities and they end up basically causing problems that we'll talk about in a moment great thank you guys great questions we'll come back to you um, right before the end of the presentation and have some more so mark i see a, a picture of marine patrol up next Excellent. All right. So I just wanted to share with you some of the work that we're actually doing at the moment and also talk about, again, in a bit more detail, some of the problems that we're facing looking after our marine parks. Again, remember that these parks basically are very much influenced by the activities of people. One of the things I talked about a bit earlier was the idea that um, these are protected, so no animals are allowed to be harmed or taken away from the area, including fishing. So my my team, our rangers who get out on the waterways are out making sure and our, our partners with in the, fish, the fisheries officers are out there patrolling our parks and making sure that people are not doing the right, uh, not doing the wrong thing. Um, and if they're, if they're caught fishing, uh, they get a fine basically. And that certainly is a very strong reminder of the fact that they shouldn't be doing what they can, uh, what they are. We do do a lot of work to try and make sure that people know where they are, to know that these areas are protected. So we've got signs, we've got uh, we've got information that's available at, at boat ramps and places like that. We also have a fantastic app that we use to help fishers know when they're out on the water, whether they're inside or outside the park. And just like on the Great Barrier Reef, you've got some important areas that are no take or they're protected, fully protected, where you're not allowed to fish. This is an important part of the work that we're doing. Um, one of the things, and again, without going to too much detail about what this slide's saying, it's just saying that, this, that our land and the sea and our protected areas, our marine protected areas, are very much connected to what's going on outside of them. So it might be well and good to have a, a park that's got a boundary around it, but in many ways, a lot of the threats to our parks actually come from outside. We've got to start to think about the system as a whole. It's about 
all of the connectedness between the ocean and connecting it also to the things that are happening on the land. Now, this little slide is just a reminder, and this is one of the things that I work on a lot, is just to look at the ways that we need to work with our partners in the community, our partners in industry, our partners in go other government organisations, and, the, and the, most importantly, um, people like yourselves, young people and old people alike, to understand that the world is connected. Our systems all link up with each other. And if we start to think that we could, all the work we have to do happens inside the boundary of the park, we're actually kidding ourselves that we're actually going to be effective. What we need to do is actually have good relationships with our partners and all the ones I just mentioned to make sure that they can understand that down here at the bottom of the hill, sometimes what we say is the big puddle at the bottom of the hill, um, that we're all connected to that in some one way or, or another. Uh, in the next slide, you can see some of the things that I was talking about a moment ago in relation to uh, some of the animals. So what are we looking at here, Jacqueline? It's a bed of seagrass. It's a bed of seagrass, all right. And this is, again, a good example of a whole lot of seagrass that basically is looking nice and green and healthy. If we just forward to the next part of that slide, you can see what it looks like when some of those nutrients, I think we've just skipped a slide there, but eventually that seagrass can be covered over with all sorts of uh, funny algae and things that basically stop it from being able to get the sunlight it needs to grow. This is the nutrients that I was talking about a little while ago uh, in relation to the things that wash off our farms that come out of our urban waterways um, and down through our streets that create this algae that covers the surface of the seagrass, stops it from being able to get proper sunlight and therefore it starts to make it a bit hard. So again, that's not something that's happening inside the park, it's something that happens up on the hills. Um, and again, when people start to think about how do we look after our water quality, the things that are flowing from the land and into the sea, um, it, it's all got to do with essentially the effect that um, this nutrients, the nitrogen and the phosphorus that are coming out of the, uh, coming off the land, how they can impact on places like seagrass. In the next slide, you can see an example um, of one of our uh, significant marine pests. Now, it looks like a very pretty sea star. I know this is one of the ranges down at Wilson's Promontory Marine National Park in south, uh, the very southern tip of Australia, of mainland Australia, I should say. Sorry, Tasmanians. Um, the, you can see there in the photo, uh, guy, uh, one of our rangers, Matt Hoskins, who's holding up a sea star there. And as I said, it looks like a pretty sea star. And you might sort of think if you just saw it, um, oh, that's just great. It's just a fantastic thing to have. Well, no, uh, this was the first, Matt was the person, for, uh, person who first found this northern Pacific sea star down in the Wilson's Promontory Marine National Park. And it was very scary because these, these sea stars produce something like 15 to 20 million eggs, um, each individual female. So they obviously have to have males and females in that space. But um, to actually think that there was a small population starting down at the southern end of uh, Australia and in the Marine National Park was a very, very uh, worrying time. So we did a lot of work to try and make sure that those things didn't become established and have been trying to manage those and stop them from spreading. Unfortunately, uh, because the sea is very connected to each other, in more recent years, we've actually, in fact, only in the last uh, last year, um, and even two months ago, uh, we now know that these sea stars have moved a lot further east and they're now in a place called the Gippsland Lakes right over in eastern Victoria. So look, this is a problem that is going to continue to be a real challenge for us. How do we prevent animals and plants that are problems or are pests, marine pests, uh, how do we stop them from spreading, uh, whether it's through natural means, which is very difficult to do, but because these things can be easily spread by boats and by people and their activities, um, we're trying to get the people, the uh, Victorians, to understand that cleaning your boat, making sure that you check your equipment before you move from one place to another, particularly washing things and drying them properly, um, is a really good way of stopping these things from spreading. In the next slide, um, you can see, what are we looking at on this one, Jacqueline? Looks like a beach that has some odd blue objects on it. Okay, all right. So this is now getting to the, the heart of the issue we're talking about today, the issue of plastics. Again, this is a, a, a special place, again, down at Wilson's Promontory, probably one of the most uh, protected places in Victoria, uh, where there is no shops, there is no, there is no towns, there's no cities. Um, it's a beach, basically, which is what we would say in many ways is pristine. It's, it's very isolated from other beaches, uh, uh, sorry, other parts of the Victorian coastline. But if you have a look closely at what you can see, this is a close-up looking at the sand, and some of the things that are found in the sand there are quite disturbing. You can probably pick out from the colours in particular, but some of the shapes that are in there, that unfortunately at this little beach called Cotter's Beach in Wilson's Promontory National Park, there's actually a lot of plastic there. 
And the question then should come, where did that plastic come from? It certainly hasn't come from the local national park. It's not, not there aren't any shops, as I said a moment ago, and there certainly aren't the problem, uh, the places or the sources of plastics that you might expect. So this is just a very good reminder to us all, I think, of the fact that plastics, once they enter the environment, they don't just simply disappear. Um, yes, they float on the surface of the water and that's how they can spread, uh, but they also break down in size and these little tiny bits of plastic, including other things we call nurdles, as well as a whole lot of other plastic fragments uh, can travel for many, many hundreds and even thousands of kilometres to places where they can start to impact. Uh, this particular beach, Cotter's Beach, is actually an important place for uh, one of our rare birds that we have on our Victorian coast called the hooded plover to breed. And unfortunately, again, when you're looking at something bright and nice and small and potentially could be a little bit of food, uh, one of the problems we find with plastics is that birds tend to pick them up and think that they're think they're eating something nice, something healthy. Uh, unfortunately, those plastics, once they enter into the bird's body, uh, can become really a big problem. And these little tiny fragments of plastics or microplastics, as we call them, um, are a real issue. And they're not just found around our cities. This is, as I said, one of the most uh, pristine parks that we have in Victoria, um, at the southern end of Australia. These plastics have come from a long, long way away. In our next slide, I think you can see in, in this particular one, uh, some, uh, some students and some, uh, some people basically working doing a survey out in one of, another one of our marine national parks uh, here closer to Port Phillip Bay. Uh, this is actually at a place called Mud Island, so I was only there a couple of days ago, and we did a repeat of the same activity. What they're doing here is just simply trying to sort through and work out what is actually washed up on the beach. So what sort of materials are there? Trying to understand, again, um, where, where these things might have come from. Again, we can pick things up and put them in the bin. We can remove rubbish. But one of the other things we need to think about is where does this stuff come from? How can we stop these things from entering the water in the first place? And again, a lot of the great resources that have been developed through the Plastic Seas uh, program have been very much focused on just simply reducing litter at the source rather than thinking about the need to go through and clean it up. In the next slide, um, you can see here, I think, somebody cleaning up a beach. Is that right? No, sorry. No, this is the one of a balloon, a close-up of a balloon. I should go, if we could just quickly go back to the one of the balloon. Um, this is also found on Mud Islands. And again, um, I don't want to name brands or anything like that, but quite often uh, people don't think that, you know, a whole lot of balloons could be a problem for the ocean. And again, this is a problem around the world. I know in the United States, where I've had the pleasure of working up in places like the Baltimore Aquarium many, many years ago, um, they've had big issues with things like mylar balloons or the balloons that people might let go after a big football match or at a big event. Um, in this particular case, you can probably if you look closely see a brand name there so these were these were balloons that were distributed as part of a, a fundraising activity for a foundation but again I'm sure that the people who put these activities together weren't really thinking of the fact that those balloons don't necessarily end up in the rubbish bin or end up in the uh, end up in the recycling bin what they happens to them is quite often they escape they either float off into the air and they can travel through the air for a long long way um, or they can be washed down when they break down through our streets and through our urban waterways um, in this particular case, this balloon, again, was in a in a marine national park. It was with one of the most sea, important seabird breeding sites in Victoria. Um, and as you can see, the balloon's starting to break up into little fragments. Again, the, the seagulls or the ibis or the terns or the pelicans that breed on this island, as particularly the chicks, don't know the difference between rubbish and plas uh, rubbish and food. And they'll pick up these little fragments. And again, at the very first part of their life, they're already starting to get a feed and get their stomachs and their, bo their bodies uh, full of plastic. So it's again, one of, the, one of the things that I think we can all sort of look at, it's a pretty simple problem in many ways. If we stop letting balloons go into the environment, we could actually stop these, these problems from occurring a long, long way from where the balloon was actually being used in the first place. Unfortunately, as you can see in the next slide, um, we've got actually also stuff that actually comes out of the ocean. There are bits of plastic and ropes and fishing nets and things like that that, again, come from activities that might be happening out at sea. So when people are catching food out in the ocean using nets and things like that, quite often those things break or uh, become tangled up in, in uh, things under the surface. Um, um, and again, they can end up washing up. This is another park right over in the west of Victoria, and you can see some volunteers here that are again in a very remote part of Victoria, 
but they're dealing with literally tons and tons of rubbish that's been or plastics that have been washed up uh, from the ocean from the activities that have actually been happening uh, out at sea so whether we're talking about the stuff that's coming from the land or the stuff that's coming from the water plastics are a real problem because they they stay in the environment for a long time it takes a long time for them to break down uh, and when, even when they do break down into small fragments they still can become a problem because of the fact that things might see them as food and start to eat them I guess the guess the solutions the ones that we need to be starting to think about here are just what can we actually do to stop those problems from occurring in the first place again Jacqueline if you wouldn't mind just telling me what's on the slide there we have the seals again oh okay so back to the seals now this is a it sometimes looks a bit bit like a bit funny because you can see here uh, if you look very closely that one of the seals is actually uh, wearing a, a what looks like a, a mask and snorkel well, it's got no snorkel but it's certainly got a face mask on and again this is not something that's been caused from a long long way away but by people simply losing bits of gear that mask is now wrapped around the seal's head um, as the seal continues to grow, that mask is not going to get any bigger at all and eventually it'll start to cut into the seal's skin. Um, we've unfortunately got a big problem, particularly around, around Port Phillip Heads, uh, with plastics, things like plastic packing tape, uh, plastic fishing line, plastic and as, I, as you can see in this photo here, um, entangling the seals and actually causing them quite significant harm, or in some cases when we've had se uh, seals that have been very seriously injured by plastic, again, you know, cutting into their skin, uh, causing them a great deal of distress, um, in some cases to the point where, they, where we've had to get uh, some of the specialists down from Melbourne Zoo to, to actually uh, euthanise or to put the, put the seals to sleep because they're in such a bad way, they're so unhealthy and they're so stressed by the, by the injuries that have been caused by plastics. So plastics can affect things in many different ways. They can affect things because they become part of the food chain. They can affect things because they entangle things. They can affect animals and plants in the sea because they smother things, uh, cover things over. Um, they are a real problem. And our work in Parks Victoria is very much to try and encourage people to think about being healthy in our lifestyle, to get out and enjoy our wonderful park system. We have a saying, we say healthy parks and healthy people. It means go out and enjoy the environment, but also think about what we can do while we're out there when, or when we're back at home again, to look after and make sure that our park environments are actually kept healthy too. It's not just all about having great places to go for adventures and to go snorkeling or diving or walking on the beach or in the case of our land parks to go for you know, fantastic trips across the mountains or through the forest. It's also about what can we do to help to look after as people? What can we actually do to help to look after and make sure that our parks are going to be healthy into the future? So I hope that that's uh, given you a little bit of an understanding of some of the work that we do. Again, some of the challenges that we're facing in terms of looking after and making sure our park systems are actually going to be healthy in the future, but also some of the things that we can do as a community, as individuals, uh, the great work that you guys are doing up there in Queensland to reduce plastic litter from getting into the environment in the first place. It's much better to do that kind of work than it is to go around and pick it all up at the end of the day. We can stop our plastic bags from washing into the ocean. Um, there's no issues with the turtles. The turtles aren't going to be mistaking them for jellyfish. If we can stop the uh, microplastics from entering the ocean or the, the things that break down uh, from the plastic materials that do unfortunately end up there um, and stop that at the source, it doesn't mean that our seabirds are not going to be as affected by uh, picking up and feeding it to their chicks. Um, so there's a lot of things that we can do as individuals and as I said, great work that you guys are doing up there in Queensland to stop the plastic bags. Um, and Again, you know, use things like recyclable cups, use things like the, like the wax wraps you've made as well instead of the cling wraps, use things like reusable bags uh, when you go to the shops. There's small things it can do, but the other thing is to talk about these things, to help make sure that the adults, the people around the world actually understand that it's not just something you can just throw away, it's not something that disappears, it's actually something that stays in our environment for a long time and it does have quite serious effects on animals and plants uh, in the marine environment. For our parks, we really want people to understand that these are special places, they've got special and unique animals and plants that live within them, and we've all got to take our little bit of personal responsibility to do what we can to look after them. Great, Mark, thank you so much. So we're gonna head back to the Kalki State School for a couple of final questions. Hi, my name is Brody, and why did you become interested in the geography? 
Oh, my job. Look, I actually sometimes think I've got the best job in the world or one of the best jobs. Sometimes when I'm out in the water, which unfortunately isn't as often as I'd like it to be, um, I get the chance to go out and spend time in these beautiful places across Victoria. I'm a scuba diver and I love, like Jacqueline does, love getting under the water and seeing all sorts of things, not only here in Victoria, but I do come up to Queensland occasionally and I'm very lucky that I've also had the chance to visit other places overseas. Um, so my work in, uh, uh, in is, is very much connected to my absolute love for the ocean environment. And that's why I feel like when I get up in the morning, I'm very privileged to actually have the chance to help to look after that wonderful, beautiful environment that we all get a chance to enjoy. So yeah, look, I've had a background in, in science. I've also used to be once upon a time a teacher. So I know what you know what the life in the classroom is all about. But for me, uh, the best best classroom for life really is getting out in the beautiful outdoors to celebrate the fact we've got these magnificent environments. And yeah, that's why I do what I do, because it's just such an important thing to do to help to look after the places that I think we all love. Thank you, Mark. That's so great. And how great is it that we get to wake up every morning and follow our passions, right? It's so wonderful. <laughs> and that's what we want all of you guys to do when you grow up, too. Now, I think uh, Mrs. Stuchberry's class has something they want to show us. Can you guys explain what you're going to show us real quick? It's, hi, my name is Louisa, and I'm in year two. Can we please try and save the animals in the ocean? Uh, if, is everyone protecting the ocean and are all the animals going to get extinct? Yeah, look, that's that's a great a great uh, statement, and I think it's it is important that we all do what we can. Again, it doesn't matter whether you're in grade two or you're in you're 92 years old. There's lots of things that we can do to make sure that our beautiful blue backyard, our beautiful in marine environment, whether we're here in here in Australia, here in Victoria, um, here in Queensland, here in Florida, here on the on the uh, west coast of the United States, there's lots of things that we can all do. We all, at the end of the day, connect to the sea. It is the place where life started. It is one of the most wonderful environments. Uh, we've got some pretty special places around the world that uh, we're privileged to actually have. But again, we've got to always remember, as I said a bit earlier on, that we're all connected in some way to the ocean. Um, and doing the little things that we can do or the big things that we can do as a whole community uh, to stop um, materials that are bad for the environment from getting there in the first place are really great ways of making sure that beautiful marine environment is going to be there. And as I said earlier on, it might sound like a bit of a strange thing, but one day even you little grade two people might have grandchildren and I'd like to think that your grandchildren inherit a world that is as beautiful as or even better than what we've got today. Great, thank you so much. And I love that you guys are Earth Echo engineers. Look at that. So Mark, they have been working through the Plastic Seas curriculum to see what they can do to help with the plastic problem. You guys wanna say one more thing? Earth Echo engineers! Yay, we are so proud of you, Earth Echo. You are the best engineers I think we've ever had. Um, so thank you guys so much. Um, we would encourage you all to follow along with Parks Victoria, um, and you can follow their website. I would also encourage you to check out their Facebook and Instagram. I know that I love looking back at the pictures, and it makes me miss makes me miss Victoria a lot, and all of Australia. Um, and I'd like to go over some upcoming events that we have here with Earth Echo. Um, we have in March a, a big event for us, which is World Water Monitoring Day, which is March 22nd. So we encourage everybody to go out and monitor your water and add it to our international database at monitorwater.org. And again, this event is part of our 2018 expedition Plastic Seas launch. Um, we visited Melbourne, Australia, and we got to meet amazing people like Mark, who you guys got to see today. Um, and we also created a series of videos documenting our plastic journey in Australia. Some STEM career close-up videos that talk about the experts that we met in on expedition. And those youth in action videos that highlight the amazing youth that are working in their community against ocean plastic pollution. Again, I would encourage teachers all over the world to check out our amazing lesson plans that were created by our 25 expedition fellows. So they are STEM lessons created by teachers for teachers, and they are available for free to download off of earthecho.org. Thanks to our presenting sponsor, the Northrop Grumman Foundation. 
Of course, we couldn't have done Expedition with all of our amazing partners, including Mark and Parks Victoria. So thank you so much. We also would encourage you all to follow along Earth Echoes um, Adventures um, at Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and you can also sign up for our newsletter as well. Uh, this year we'll be heading to England to have an expedition looking at fisheries, which is very exciting. We would also again like to thank the Northrop Grumman Foundation. They sponsor our expeditions program, but they also continue to generously support Earth, Earth Echo International as a whole, and we want to give them a big thank you. So thank you, Mrs. Stutre's class. You guys want to wave goodbye. We appreciate you joining us and all your excellent questions. And thank you, Mark, so much for joining us live from your marine protected area and co-hosting this live event with us. Um, and we will let you know when we have our next virtual field trip coming up. Um, it's Monday evening for those of you in the U.S. and Tuesday at noon for those of you in Australia. So we hope to see you then. And we remind everybody to keep exploring. Bye, everyone. Bye.